my great pleasure to welcome Meiko Takayama. She's a very, very sought-after uh, sought speaker to the IIT GLC conference in the state of today. Uh, Miko is the founder and CEO of Advancing Women Executives. And her goal is something that's very close to my heart. She wants to see more women in senior executive positions. Go Miko. So um, Miko has actually um, have received a lot of recognition. She was named a 2015 Women of Influence by LA Biz. And uh, she created AWE as an amalgamation of uh, leading executive recruiters uh, focusing on C-level searches in various fields. Today, Miko is holding a workshop for us to help us understand how to market ourselves better and have better personal branding. Welcome again, Miko. yourself, what would you say? And uh, I had not done the workshop ahead of time. I was sitting in the room, and I really struggled with that. So I think, uh, I'm hoping that you will take everyone through this exercise. But I did You're making the room panic right now. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you, Nina. <laughs> uh, but afterwards, I spent a lot of time thinking about it, and I'm hoping that I've come up to an answer that uh, I can now say confidently that I couldn't at that time. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that, Nina. Um, so yeah, so we will go through that exercise, and I, I will, I'm now convinced that you will probably not listen to me until we actually get to that exercise, because you're all thinking right now, what am I going to say, what am I going to say? And don't worry, we're not going to go individually amongst everybody, because that might take the rest of the afternoon and evening into it. So again, my name is Meiko Takayama, and I'm the founder and CEO of Advancing Women Executives. I'll share with you a little bit more about of who we are and what we do later, um, but I want this to be an incredibly interactive session. So with that, I want to begin with asking the question, statistics. So Nina, you already know the answers to this, but does anybody know what percentage of women are currently in executive management in the US? Just <laughs> <laughs> You've done this before. 17%, that's actually a higher number than the number that... 4.5, 14, oh wait, there's... Four, it's actually 14%. So, so it's true, and you know what, the numbers are uh, varied. The reason why the numbers are varied is because you have to actually take a look at what does executive management mean. I'm actually extremely frustrated with Silicon Valley because management in Silicon Valley, to try to up the numbers of women in Silicon Valley, they've really lowered what they mean by management, right? So typically most companies think VP, SV, B and above is management. In Silicon Valley, it is down to director. So I think that that speaks to the level of women in Silicon Valley. So these are going to be all obvious numbers to you. 19% of women on board seats. Um, now what's probably not surprising to you, what you've already heard also, is, is that companies that have more women at the top financially outperform their peers that don't. 
So again, companies that have more women that top financially outperform their peers that don't. As I look across the audience, I see some very brave men in this room. So I wanted to actually say, um, don't worry, uh, we are not a male bashing organization at all. Um, we are an organization that embraces all different types of behaviors. We're going to start talking a little bit about behaviors, but I will call upon the men to answer one question later on. So, um, so you know, this is the question of why is it? Why are the numbers the way that they are today? Why haven't they changed? This is an incredibly complex issue. And so what we find is, is that we love to ask the question, where are the binders of women? It's a little bit of a dated statement, but Mitt Romney, I'm not sure if you remember this, back in the old election, said, oh, they're binders of women um, in Massachusetts. You know, binders of women, ironically, is not something that's, I, that's, that's said uncommon, though. I oftentimes will hear that even from women, they'll say, oh, yeah, we've got folders filled with women's names in them. So why is it? Why are the numbers where they are today? Again, what we feel is a lot of it has to do with unconscious bias, and I'm going to talk a little bit about unconscious bias later. But when we take away unconscious bias, we think, number one, networks. So what we find is, is that generally speaking, and I'm going to be making a lot of generalizations today, we find that women tend to have narrow and deep professional networks, whereas men, broad and shallow. And broad and shallow is actually really great because it simply means that more people know who you are. So remember that. So we were just talking a little bit earlier, and someone said, you know, part of the issue is showing up. So thank you so much for even showing up today. What we also find is, is that women and men, generally speaking, focus on their jobs and their careers very differently. So women, we may think about our job as one ball that we're juggling, our career is another one, our family, our teens, ourselves. You know, we're trying to juggle five different balls. It's too many balls to juggle. So typically, the first ball that gets dropped is career. I don't have time for that, right? Whereas men tend to view their job and their career as one and the same. I'm doing my job to further my career. My job, my career is my job. So, and then finally, what we find is that, generally speaking, men tend to promote themselves more readily than women. Now, when we talk about this, we're not saying that men, you're running down the hallway beating your chest saying that you're so great, right? <laughs> It's actually much more subtle. It is the, hey, just want to update you on what I did. Hey, just want to let you know that I made that phone call. Hey, just want you to know that I got in touch with that client, or I finished that project on time within budget. Finish that project on time within budget. That's not something that comes out of the mouths of a lot of women, right? Because we might be thinking to ourselves, what? That's what we're getting paid to do. Why should I tell people that? It's amazing, though, because it actually starts at a very young age. So I have two sons. I have a 12-year-old and a 10-year-old son. And not ironically, my 12-year-old is a complete alpha male. He actually says to me on a regular basis, you know, I think I'm going to start a company called Advancing Male Executives. <laughs> so um, so he, he does this thing which is really amazing. I will ask him to go and clean up his room. He immediately has to come back to me and tell me that he's done it. You know, I ask my friends who have daughters, I say, do your daughters do that? No. So if there's anything that you learn, please have your daughters start doing that now. Start telling you, I just want you to know I've done that. Because again, we tend to live in this world where we feel like, well, if I'm being asked to do this, of course, they should expect me to have done it. So remember that. So when I talk about promoting yourself, I don't mean make sure that you schedule a meeting on a regular basis with your boss to go through the checklist of everything that you've done. This is literally just the passing the hallway. Hey, just want you to know that I did that. Dropping the note, finish with that project. Very, very informal. Because the more and more you start to build that up, your boss starts to think, wow, she's working on a lot of projects. She's doing a lot of work. This is fantastic. So with that, this is the point that I will give you two minutes to turn to your neighbor. So this is the, the point where everyone starts getting a little nervous. And I want you to introduce yourself. Now, I want you to introduce yourself. I want you to pretend that you're in an elevator with the CEO of a company that you truly admire. You've got about 20 seconds to introduce yourself. Now, spend that 20 seconds in the elevator not talking about how great that CEO's company is. Don't ask that CEO questions. This is a chance for you to be memorable. So I want you to turn to the person next to you and introduce yourself, and I'll give you two minutes to do that.
long as you talk about myself. Any other? Yeah, please. Yeah, okay. I don't know what to focus on. I'm not going to be in the line. Yes. Yes. Oh. <laughs> okay, ask me, could you introduce yourself to the team? Is everybody? I'm Sushmita, class of 83, and um, yeah, I really, really didn't realize, I mean, I was talking to my best friend, we were both in IIT together, so it was easy to talk, but never realized I could actually, wow, that's me, yes, that is me. So could you tell, tell us what you actually said to your friend? Okay, so I said, I'm Sushmita, I'm class of 83, and I'm a problem solver and an entrepreneur. So in any situation with a home office, I try to solve problems, and as a result, I have started philanthropic startups and done a social business as a salon owner. So I've gone from technology to everything, and I realized, bottom line, I'm a problem solver. That's great. And a risk taker. Problem solver. You set up the bar high. There's somebody else raising hand over here about what their experience was. Yes. So you didn't you at first you didn't know what to say, so you couldn't say anything, and then you thought, how bold can I get? Yes. yes. Absolutely. Great. Yes, call it back. You were fantastic and we nailed it, and the CEO offered us a job. <laughs> <laughs> On a different note, uh, one thing we both observed is when we introduce ourselves, we introduce our professional selves and our personal selves, which we both like, but we didn't know if that's what you want us to do, uh, and really, and, to the CEO. Absolutely. You know, it really, it's, it's every situation is going to be different. So every situation is going to be different. But the reason why we're actually going to be talking about professional brand is what you just did right now is you just gave an elevator pitch, literally. You're in the elevator, you had to pitch yourself, right? But what we're going to talk about today is going to be your professional brand statement, which is a little bit more of a macro overview of who are you, what do you want to be, how do you represent yourself? What makes you unique? And that's a lot easier than to create different elevator pitches once you have that broader overview of what your brand is. So just out of curiosity, has anybody ever run into, literally has that ever happened to anybody? Were you in an elevator? Yes, could you share with us your story? You're in an elevator and all of a sudden, or you may have been somewhere else. So my name is Poonam Nagpal and I am a Cisco system, I work there. And I was in a building where John Chamber sits and I was just walking and uh, I just happened to run into it and we were there together in elevator. <laughs> so, and I, I kind of knew this stuff a little bit, so I said, uh, quality starts with me, John. I'm Poonam Nagpal and I'm running a women network here in your company. And then, you know, but I did a mistake. I asked him a question instead of, you know, keep continuing telling who I am, really. I asked, John, do you know what are the top two women issues in your company? And he said, no, you tell me. So I, he was just in listening mode. Then I told him, like, you know, work-life balance is the top most, and then parenting is another. So he was very appreciative of me speaking up and doing all the good work I'm doing, and he thanked me, but I wish I could have told him, you know, I am going to be chief people officer for your company. <laughs> Great story. So, you know what? I don't think it was bad that you asked a question. You asked a question where it started a, a dialogue, and you asked a question that was really unique, right? Because typically, the questions what we might ask would be, what would, just the simple thing, what do you think of the weather today, right? <laughs> so, because we don't know what we're going to say. Or we might say something along the lines of, we're trying to actively suck smart, so we say, so what direction are you heading in the, with the company? You know, or what is going to happen with the, you know, you might say something where it's, but you brought, you asked a question that was related to something that affected you, that was helpful in creating your brand. You know, we, these moments where we run into people actually happen a lot more than you realize. And that's when you all of a sudden realize, oh, you know, I just missed that opportunity. I love to share the story of myself where I was at the um, San Jose airport one day and I was talking on the phone to my husband and all of a sudden the jetway door slammed open and Meg Whitman started walking out right in front of me. And I live in LA, so I kind of view everything as being like a TV show or a movie. So that's when everything went in slow motion for me. You know, so she's very tall and she's kind of very boldly, regally walking out. And just 
as she looks at me and sees me looking at her, I'm literally mouthing the words, Meg Whitman, <laughs> to my husband. And, he's, and I say to him, oh my God, it's Meg Whitman, I have to go and get her, I'm gonna go get her. So she sees that I see her and that I recognize her, and she starts running away from me. <laughs> she thinks, oh my goodness. So I start to run after her. Now clearly, I'm not a very tall person, some women will appreciate this. I was wearing a tight skirt and high heels. It's not a very good combination. So I'm looking through the airport, and I can't get to her. And I call my husband back, and I say to him, oh, I can't believe it. I missed my chance. I didn't get a chance to actually speak with Meg Whitman. The first words out of his mouth, what were you going to say to her? And that's when I had my aha moment. This is actually before I had launched awe. But then I thought, wow, what was I going to say to her? And literally, I thought, because I hadn't thought about it, the very first words that probably would have come out of my mouth, which are words that we as women use way too often, is, or, I'm sorry. I probably would have said, I'm sorry. First of all, what is sorry about a, how can I be apologetic about the fact that I'm running after her purposefully, right? <laughs> but I probably would have said, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to trouble you. And in fact, that's when I had the aha moment of, I really need to understand what this brand is. And it took me a very long time to feel comfortable. So what we talk about today, you will likely not walk out of here knowing what your brand is. You will likely not be able to walk out of here comfortably talking about who you are. It takes practice. Many of us drive. We live in California. So you know what? Actually, practice while you're driving. Literally, the more and more comfortable you feel about saying who you are and what you do, who you want to be, and so forth, the more comfortable it will be. We have these things called saboteurs on our shoulders that oftentimes will be saying to you, you can't say that. That's not what you are. You sound like you're bragging. It's imposter syndrome, right? But the more you say it, the more comfortable you are. Now, the reason why we're talking about branding today, though, in particular, is we find that as women, we tend to, when we talk about our brands, we actually sound like job descriptions. And you know what? There's nothing that unique about a job description. But every single one of you is incredibly unique. So remember that. When you talk about yourselves, you do not want to sound like a job description. You don't want to sound about something where it could be just a you know, bullet-pointed issue. <laughs> so let's actually talk a little bit about gender and branding. So I'll go through this very quickly. The reason why it is so incredibly important to actually own your own brand is because there is a lot of unconscious bias out there. So unconscious bias is the way that we think without even realizing we think that way. So this is an example. Two people at the same level within their company, they had a performance review. During their performance review, the woman went first. They're the same level of the company. They're both very successful. The woman goes first, and she's told she cared for her clients and took very good care of their needs. She thought, fantastic. Great. I'm doing well. He then went, and he was told he had strong relationships with his clients and was very reliable. So not knowing these individuals, if you had to, who would you promote? The second one. Yeah. Why? Sounds, sounds more professional. Sounds stronger. Right? Sounds proactive. Reliability is. Reliability is. Caring is probably a pretty good thing for a company too, right? Mm -hmm. But the woman sounds boring. She's boring. <laughs> you know, but this is the thing. This is where unconscious bias is. Isn't it a shame that the words like caring are not actually considered leadership characteristics? You know, what's wrong with the society that as a leader, you can't say that you're caring? You can say that you're reliable. You can say that you're strategic. You can say that you're analytical. The caring? Not so much. So the aha moment that, yes? Women are expected to be caring. Women are expected to be caring, absolutely. So. Uh, that's true, so that's true. Once you're a leader, that's true. In fact, going back to Meg Whitman, one of the things that she actually does is, is that she feels that she should do everything that everyone within the organization does. So she actually cleans up after. You know, if there's a party, she cleans up. She says, I'm not going to do anything that no one else within the organization do, does. But you know what? She can do it because she's Meg Whitman. 
So gender and branding. So the aha moment here is that it was one person delivering both reviews. One person. It was a woman. She wasn't trying to downgrade the woman, nor was she trying to upgrade the man. But when she started thinking, oh, why is this woman so good? Oh, you know what, she's so good because she's so caring. Why is the guy good? Oh, he's good because he's got really strong relationships. You know, my voice even changed yeah. when I talked about that, right? So be conscious of this. This is the reason why it is so incredibly important to own your own brand. Now, at no point am I saying you need to become like a man, but what I am saying is that there are rules to the game in business today that we all recognize. Women are not playing by those rules. So, and we oftentimes aren't characterized as it kind of within the, those boundaries. So I'll give you an example. Many of you probably have heard of this case study. It's a Heidi and, or Howard. Have you already talked about this here today? No, no? Okay, so let me just quickly walk you through. This is a case study that was done by a professor at Columbia University where he gave one class this uh, CV of an individual that was incredibly accomplished and put the name Heidi on it. Gave the same CV to another class and put the name Howard on it. Asked both classes two things. Question number one, what do you think of this individual? Both the Heidi class and the Howard class came back and said, amazing, totally accomplished, leaders in their field. Second question, would you like to work for them? Howard class, absolutely. He's a leader. I can learn so much from him. He would be a great mentor. He'd have my back. The Heidi class? No. I don't trust her. I think she's very aggressive. I think she clawed her way to the top. Is that unbelievable? So the aha moment here is that this is a true story. This is actually a woman named Heidi Rosen. She lives here in Silicon Valley. She is a VC at DFJ. And this happened to her. So this is what's called unconscious bias, the bias that we all hold around what women should be, like in business. So this is a great example, which is that the line that women need to walk in business is that we need to be highly competent and warm. If there's not the warmth in us, then we're considered a little too aggressive, a little too bitchy, right? But if you're warm, then you're fit into that very thin line. The other side of the line is too timid. So it's a very fine line, which unfortunately, men don't actually have to be. Men, highly confident. If you're confident, that's great. I just spoke to uh, one of our members today. He's a male executive, he's a head of HR, and he said, it is not lost on me when I go into a room and uh, someone delivers a project to me, and my response is, thank you so much for doing the work, but you got it all wrong, and I don't want you to go back and do it again. And the team comes back and says, okay. And that if my female colleagues were to go in and say the exact same thing, the room's response would be, wow, she was really harsh. <laughs> so remember that. Remember that this is unconscious bias and how it's incredibly complex, does not make our lives easier, but at least to be aware of this. That the aha moment here is, is that this study was done 10 years ago, about 11 years ago. Just last year, they redid it again. And again, we have to remember, the classroom was both men and women, so it wasn't just men. 10 years later, the exact same results. So things haven't changed in over a decade. They've changed actually a little bit, which is that, ironically, Howard is a little less likable now. <laughs> I'm not really quite sure what that means. But, so what's the silver lining? So you're probably all thinking this is so incredibly depressing that Mako's up here. We're supposed to be talking about branding, and the great thing is, is that we love this quote by Alice Walker, the most common way people give up their hope, but their power is they think they don't have any. So at least you know about this. So we're here to provide awareness, action, and change. So who are we? So Advancing Women Executives, we're a business service. We work with VP level above corporate executives um, in the Bay Area, San Francisco, Silicon Valley, LA, New York, and Chicago. And this is a list of some of the companies that we work with. Likely, we work with almost every company that is represented here. Um, this is one of a number of different sessions that we lead. First one, we talk about branding statements, and this is what we're going to be focusing on. We also do one around the elevator pitch. We talk about building professional connections, and then mentors and sponsors. Ultimately, we do it in this order because we find that in order to ultimately find a sponsor, you need to actually know who you are, know what you want to be, be able to articulate that, have a good connections and networks, then you can actually ultimately find a sponsor that can help you with your career. 
So anybody from marketing in the room? Great. So uh, people raise their hand. Do you know what the definition of brand is? Yes. Awareness. Yeah, what? Awareness. Awareness? Absolutely. So it is awareness. It is what makes you unique from the user of another service or seller of another service. So what makes you unique? So just throw out some names of brands. What are some names of good brands? Apple? Coca-Cola? J&J? Coca 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 Kleenex. Kleenex. Absolutely. These are amazing brands, right? I'm going to actually bring up a brand, Walt Disney Company. So we're going to step away from tech right now. Walt Disney Company. So when you think about the Disney Company, what do you actually, Walt Disney, what do you think about? Mickey Mouse? Creative entertainment? Disney World? Movies? Clean, imagination? Kids, fun, the happiest place on earth? Right? Experience? So you know what, think of this, aside from when you said Disney World and actually movies, Everything else was more of a feeling, a kind of idea. It wasn't really actually talking about what Walt Disney does, right? So Walt Disney does everything. They own resorts, they own cruises, there's the theme parks, there are movies, there's music, there's television, they own ABC. They're a huge conglomerate, yet when we think about them, you can just simply say the happiest place on earth, and you all automatically know. Apple, same thing. When people, when we ask, what do you think about when you think about Apple? Oftentimes innovative user-friendly, cutting edge. We don't actually say iPad, iPhone. We don't actually talk about the product. So the reason why we bring this up is because ultimately we want you to think of yourself as a Walt Disney. We want you to think of yourself as unique as an iPad, or not, sorry, iPad, as Apple. Um, the reason why I brought up an iPad is because, in fact, think about Amazon. When Amazon talks about their Kindle, there's actually not nothing, nothing unique about the Kindle. Right? In fact, if you watch the television commercials about the Kindle, they actually do a direct comparison to the iPad. They talk about the weight, they talk about the price, the screen resolution, but there's nothing special about that. Think about the Walt Disney competitors when it comes to parks and resorts. Universal Studios is a competitor. But they, the only, when I think about Universal Studios, I honestly can only think about the coupon that you get on the side of a can of Coke when you want to go there, and that's all I think about. There's nothing that's unique about it. So when you think about yourself, remember, think of it yourself as these amazing brands that have made themselves so unique that they can actually describe themselves that way, just in one, one word, a couple sentences. So this is now, we're gonna take it to the individual. So what's unique? So a head of HR came to us and said, I'm interested in getting onto a board. So we said, great, tell us what you want. Tell us, describe yourself to us. So she did, and she said, I'm an HR manager, I'm a business partner, I have metrics focus, and I've got strong ethics. We came back and said, you know what? To your own horn a little bit more. Remember what you want to do. You want to get onto a board. You're head of HR of a Fortune 100 company. So with that, she came back and said, I'm an HR leader who delivers a company culture that stimulates innovation where employees do the best work of their lives. I have a 99% retention, 90% uh, employee retention rate. I'm a trusted advisor for the compensation committee chair, and I work hard and I laugh a lot. Again, same individual. My assumption is, is that you're gonna remember the second person much more than you will the first person. So we want you to be aware of a couple of things that have been said here, though, that we oftentimes will use to describe ourselves that actually don't help us. So in the first part, she talked about how she has strong ethics. You know what? That's actually not a huge differentiator. My assumption is, is that if I were to ask every single one of you, do you have strong ethics? Do you have strong ethics? Do you have strong ethics? We'd all say we've got strong ethics, right? So by actually making this bold statement of I've got strong ethics, you're almost whispering, because other people don't. It's not that unique. But let's say, for example, she was the head of internal audit, and she had found issues within the organization that had to do with controls, and so she actually created an internal group that actually focused on the controls, then she could actually bring up the fact that she's got strong ethics. But as a head of HR getting onto a uh, board, not necessarily something that is that pertinent. We also though had issue with the fact that she said, I work hard. Why do you think we would have issue with somebody saying that they work hard? It's expected, right. It's expected. So you think about the CEOs of every company out there. That's not their brand. They don't come out and say, I'm a hard worker. 
So in fact, as an executive, that's actually something that you probably want to have within your very early part of your career. Literally your first or second year out of college. I'm a hard worker. Then, that's not something that you want to have as part of your brand. Because what happens to the hard worker? They get more work to do. <laughs> so remember that. So we like the fact that she said that she laughed a lot, but not the fact that she actually said that she was a hard worker. So these are the steps to creating a brand statement as we've created it as a company. So we view it as being a four-step process. First of all, identify the professional goal. Second, identify your top skills that align with that goal, the successes that you've had, and then synthesize those all together. What we have found with women in particular is that the most difficult point here, question here is the professional goal. How many people had difficulty in writing down exactly what their professional goal was? Just one person? Yeah. So when we talk about professional goal, I'm saying be very specific. So, because what ends up happening is, is that we talk to hundreds, if not thousands of women. We talk to hundreds of thousands of men. And what we find is, is that 90% of the time when we talk to women, they're not able to directly articulate what their professional goal is. They'll say something along the lines of, well, I don't really care about title. Or they'll say, I just, I just want more responsibility. I'd like to really have a greater voice within the organization. Um, I'd like to uh, maybe run a different department or go be in a different area. I really love what I'm doing. When we talk to men, 90% of the time, they will oftentimes say, I want to be X, Y, Z by this date. Typically, they're able to answer in one or two sentences. So, this is something that we are trying to work with a lot of women on, because if we think about what's that next step, then we will step away from the, step, the way that we actually oftentimes see women thinking, which is that we find that women, we tend to still live in this world where we feel like, well, if I work really hard, I'll get noticed. If I get noticed, I'll get promoted. Now, Satya Nadella, kind of called that karma recently, right? <laughs> so they said, don't fine, fine, karma. You know, my reaction to Satya Nadella's comments at the Grace Hopper conference about uh, six to eight months ago, I don't, does everyone remember this, what happened when he went big gaff for Microsoft saying, you know, it's karma, women shouldn't ask for raises? My perspective was, you know what, he probably would have said the exact same thing to men. The thing is, is that he doesn't recognize the behavioral differences which is that women, we would just sit back and literally work really hard and hope that karma you know, come, comes, comes to us. Um, what he doesn't recognize is that men, again, do a much better job of consistently, regularly telling people what they work on. So I love to say both women and men work really hard. Men spend half their time working talking about the hard work they're doing. I'm joking, so I don't really mean that. But think about it. Again, it's not just about working really hard, it's about actually telling people the hard work that you're doing. So remember that. And I would love to take this opportunity now and to get at least one volunteer to go through this process where I will actually walk through what your brand should look like. So you should have received the, um, the, the, the pre-worksheet if you had, had a chance to do that. But who actually wants to volunteer? Good. Great. So when we, we can, you don't have to stand up, but you can uh, get a, um, a microphone. So I'm going to write here. I'm going to try to write as neatly okay, as possible. Okay, the reason I'm volunteering is because I've had a really hard time articulating it. Okay, perfect. And thinking about it. So tell me, what is your name? Suchet Sarda. Can you spell that? Sure. S-U-C-H-E-T. Last name is S-A-R-D-A. Great, so Jet. So tell me, what is your goal? <laughs> See, this is what happens. <laughs> um, honestly, I'm not sure. Perfect. You are the perfect candidate then. You're not alone. Okay, so what do you currently do? I'm a physician. Physician? What kind of uh, medicine do you practice? Hospital medicine. Okay. Hospitalist. Are you actually a hospitalist? Yeah. Great. Fantastic. 
So you're a hospitalist now. Now, do you want to stay within medicine? I would like more of a management opportunity, mm -hmm. um, but I don't know how to go about it. So management within a hospital? Most likely. Okay, preferably. So I don't know the hospital world that well, but tell me if this is correct. So because you're a hospitalist right now, you're not actually working for the hospital, are you? <laughs> Directly. I'm employed by the hospital. You are employed. Sometimes they have separate groups, but in my hospital, we are employed. Okay, perfect. So what is the route to going into the management side within a hospital? Um, you can start by being the director of the hospitalist group. Okay, great. So you're currently an individual contributor and you don't manage anybody. Right. Right. So great. So let's actually write that your goal is to be the director of the hospital, hospitalist group. <coughs> Does that make sense? Sure. Great. So we're going to have you, your goal is to be the director of the hospitalist group. So tell me, what are your skills? Apart from being a physician? Uh -huh. Okay. Um, or or if, whatever you think your, your skills are. One of the limitations is I have a really hard time talking about myself, so <laughs> it's not easy. But um, I guess I'm good at multitasking also. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess most women are. Um, <laughs> and once I know which path I'm taking or what I want to do, um, I'm pretty good at getting things done. So, for example, um, during our first year of residency, uh, one of the things you have to do, or people like to do, is publish articles mm -hmm. or get uh, presentations in different meetings. And um, it was very daunting to look at, first of all, uh, because you're just entering the world and you don't know how to get yourself published. Um, but uh, once I figured it out, uh, in the second year I published seven, uh, which most people do only one or two and they have a hard time even doing that much. And after I had done that, it wasn't a big deal after that. So I was like, okay, then so, done that. So should we just write, uh, so let's write down you're very kind of execution focused. Yes. Great. So you're a good multitasker, you're execution focused, and tell me one, one other thing. Um, I think I shouldn't say I care about people. That's okay. You care. We hope you would. You're a physician, right? Yes. So, good. Okay. So, you know what? We're going to write these down as Suchet? Is that? Am I yes. Suchet? Okay. We're going to write these down as Suchet skills. So, we've got to remember, these are the skills that Suchet has now said. Now, I want, we, my assumption is, is that the director of the hospital's group is similar to being a manager within a corporate corporation and so forth. So I would love to kind of open this up to the entire room. So when you think about a director, be it in a hospital or in a corporation, what are the skills that you think about? Budgeting. Leadership. Leadership. She has great communication skills, which is needed. Communication skills. Can I I'm sorry? Oh, taking initiative, okay. Absolutely, taking initiative. Somebody else? Management skills. Management skills, yes. Management skills, absolutely. Delegation. Delegation? Right, which is definitely a strong management skill. Sorry? Decisive. Decisive. Mm -hmm. Again, strong management skill. Having a vision. Vision? Visionary? Mm -hmm. High expectations. This is another way for to look at it. Yes. Absolutely. So, management. So, you'll start to see, again, I've written this very quickly in not very nice handwriting, but so you started off by saying you what you currently are. You're a strong multitasker. You're very execution focused. You care, right? 
Okay. So what you did was, and this is what typically what we do, we will describe ourselves as we are today. Not necessarily as what we want to become, because again, this is part of the issue. We don't necessarily always know what we want to become. And so if you know what you want to become, then you have to start getting already into that mindset where you will start to present yourself as being able to do that. So I think that if I were to take a look at, so the skills of a director that we wrote down were leadership, communication, initiative, management, delegation, decisive, caring, visionary, high, ex kind of high expectations or raising bar, um, and flexible. Um, I'm going to actually take a couple of these and I'm gonna add some too. So I think that management skills is definitely, because you're gonna be managing individuals. I'm going to put down one other one. Business acumen. Mm. Because all of a sudden, you're going now from being an individual contributor to actually being part of the business. So you have to think about the business instead of to think about the actual hospital as opposed to just thinking about taking care of the, the patients. So business acumen. I love the word visionary. I don't think that you need to use the word visionary yet. But as you start to rise within your career, that is definitely something that I would start to include. Um, I think that we can actually include something like, let's actually take communication. Strong communicator. So, no, you know what, communication actually should go under management skills also. So, that's, so you know what, I'm gonna split up management, where management is people management, and then it's actually kind of leadership management. So, let me take this and I'm going to write down these three things. So now the skills are leadership, management, so this is people. and then business acumen. So. so leadership is being someone a strong communicator, management of manager of people, and then also you've got strong business acumen. Now the thing is, is that what you could do is, um, there's a lot of other words, you don't need to use these words. Yes, question. Domain knowledge, right? Domain knowledge. In the area of literature management, right? So that I think. Absolutely. Could that be followed under business acumen? I'm not sure if it is business acumen, but it's just like if you're in a product company, you've got to have knowledge about technology, about the product, what it does. If you're in services, it's the same thing, right? So that's domain, domain experience. Absolutely. So I, I would view that as being business acumen, understanding of kind of what the business is and why the business is one, what the per reason behind the, the product is. Um, so leadership, management of people, business acumen. So this is now totally changing what your brand is. So you need to now start to think of what are the examples of successes that you've had in being able to do this? So for example, have you done something where you were a strong leader, a strong communicator? Have you done something where you've actually managed people? Right? So the managing people doesn't even need to be, it could be even a volunteer project. But have you actually managed individuals before? Well, we lead a team um, during rounds, and there have been situations where two physicians don't get along, it gets nasty, you have to manage that. I've done that successfully. Absolutely, absolutely. So that's great, and in fact, you know, the more examples that you can give that actually have specific outcomes. Oh, do you recall that there was an issue with XYZ where I was able to actually manage that relationship effectively so that there's a positive outcome on behalf of the patient? Um, in business, it might be something along the lines of, I actually helped to manage a partner, better manage the communication between two departments where we were able to decrease the process of XYZ by 50%, 20%, and thus ultimately raising the revenue on, for the company by $10 million. Right? So the more specific you can get about these examples, the better it is. The reason, though, I say this is because this is actually for the women in the room, so this is unconscious bias. 
For men, oftentimes men are judged based on potential. Women are judged based on success. So that sucks, but it's true. Part of the, that, though, is because of the fact that we as women, we don't necessarily talk about our potential because we sit and we wait for people to tell us that we are ready for that. I don't know if you know this, you may have already talked about this earlier, but women, we will only raise our hand and say that we're ready for the next job when we can fill every single box on that, that job description. <coughs> every single box. Literally, if there's 10 and we can only fill nine and a half, we say, oh, we're not ready. <laughs> Men, 60%. Six boxes. two years ago and I have six, seven employees uh, working in US and India, and women employees especially, and they consistently underrate themselves uh, for a lot of skills where they were really doing so well. So I have to literally sit with them and tell that you're doing so well, why are you underrating yourself? And a lot of times you have to just show them that what they have done is actually way beyond and how they perceive it. So generally for them, the benchmark is really high for themselves. So you have to actually tell that you are doing so well, why are you underrating yourself? And Absolutely. men have been doing, some are really good, they, they, they judge themselves the way they are, but there are some who always overrate themselves. So it's just, it's a balance which you have, like as an employer I have to see that, you know, I'm making sure, telling my employees that don't underrate themselves, especially women. It's true, it's true. There was a study that was done recently that actually reviewed performance reviews of individuals within a large corporations. And I think it was something like 70% of the reviews, but you know, this, there's a reason why we underrate, underrate ourselves. Because 70% of, I think, the performance reviews for women had some sort of a opportunity for improvement. For men, I think it was 13%. Wow. So, Again, it's a chicken or egg thing, right? So do we underrate ourselves because we're constantly being told we need to improve? Or are we constantly being told we need to improve because we underrate ourselves? I don't know, but I think the solution is to go the opposite and just overrate ourselves. No, I don't mean overrate ourselves, but, but, I mean, but that actually happens with, um, with negotiations also. So when women negotiate, even though we think that we are negotiating so aggressively, we are always negotiating to the bottom of the bar. Men are always negotiating to the top of the bar. I don't know if you know this, but it is not uncommon for, I hear this from heads of HR all the time, it's not uncommon for men to walk into uh, their boss and say, hey, you know what, I need more money. I need more money because uh, I've got a stay-at-home wife and two kids are going to private school. <laughs> right? You're like, wow. And a lot of women, so I'll say that to women managers, so what is your response to that? And they'll say, I hate it when they do that and they come in, but I always give them more money. So, if you don't have kids, you should start having kids now and start getting <laughs> send them to private school so you have more money. But, but remember that. So it is, it is again, being bold, right? It's being bold. So, Chet, I think my recommendation would be, first of all, as you start to look at this, you might kind of step back and say, maybe I don't want to become a director of the hospitalist. Maybe I don't want to go into management, right? Because you might start to think, well, maybe I don't want to all of a sudden have to really worry about the business because what I love is I love the people. I love the patients. But start to think about that. And once you do this, you start to write out what your skills are, then understand where, how can you articulate your successes behind those skills. Has, was that helpful? I think that's helpful. Great. And you don't think you're, and you know what, one thing, actually, you just said something, I'm gonna tell, another thing I'm gonna tell women, stop saying I think. So, <laughs> no, I'm, not, I'm just gonna call you out on that. We say I think, I hope, way too much. We also say I'm sorry way too much, which I mentioned earlier. But it's amazing because I will get emails from women and they'll say, I think I'm going to do this. Why don't you say I'm going to do it? I'm going to do it. So, good. I love it. <laughs> I got some present for you. So, thank, thank you. So that's fantastic. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, I, how, how much time do I have left? I want to make sure that it's you. Less than 10 minutes, okay, perfect. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, um, 
we are going to get a list of all the participants in the session, and we're going to have a couple of office hours. So uh, we'll have it's going to be first come first serve, but um, we can do this with my team. We literally do four sessions per hour. We'll probably only be able to accommodate about eight individuals, but um, and then we'll we'll do some makeup hours also afterwards. But what it is is um, you can actually sign up and do a 15 minute walkthrough exactly what we just did with the chat with um, some members of our team. Yes, question. I have a question about the discussion right now of the dating women who are under 18 years old. Uh, I used to think it's about it's also a cultural thing that, for example, you, uh, we, te we tend to think that being humble is a better quality to have, so you don't oversell yourself, you remain humble. Absolutely. There are different cultures, say, in U.S. where you have to be more aggressive, it's sort of being, like humility is not a virtue to Is that, would you say that? Absolutely, that is definitely true, definitely true. So there is definitely, so the, the question here was about culture and how, how does culture play into this because it is actually very true. In the U.S., the U.S. is very bold and people are much more kind of out there saying this is what I want and humility is not as much of a, a leadership skill as it may be in other countries. Um, but there's subtle ways to start to incorporate a little bit of that boldness if from a cultural perspective you don't feel comfortable doing it. So I can't emphasize enough, you know, a lot of what I talk about today, realize that there's nuances to it. So I don't want everybody in this room to all of a sudden go busting into your boss's office tomorrow and saying, I need more money because I have to go to private school, right? But it is actually something that's very nuanced. So start to maybe do this update internally within your organization, where you're just updating your boss, saying, hey, this is what I'm working on. Just want you to not finish that. You know, start to do that, because then all of a sudden, individuals will start to think differently about you. So question to the group. Who do you think asks more questions in meetings? Women or men? Men. Men. OK, let me make this up again. Not making a statement in a meeting, but actually asking questions. <laughs> Women, right. So um, to the men in the room, this is where I'm going to ask you a question. Why do men not ask questions in meetings? Well, they don't want to expose themselves. They don't want to expose, they don't want to expose themselves. <laughs> right. Absolutely. So you know what? This is actually really ironic. It is oh, never, we never have to wait for a man to say, it's because I don't want to appear so I don't know something. Which is actually really ironic because I don't think it would, would, women would so readily say that, right? So women actually statistically ask more questions in meetings than men do. Reason why men don't, they don't want to expose themselves. Same reason why they don't ask for uh, directions. So, <laughs> So what ends up happening? So what ends up happening is, is that you can be working at a hospital, you can be working at a company, you can be the leader of the company, and you're asking a lot of questions. You can be looking to try to get funding for a company, and you're asking a lot of questions. Deep down inside, the unconscious bias starts to work. And when that time for that, are we going to fund this individual? By the time for that promotion, raise comes in place, all of a sudden, your manager starts to think, you know, she's really good, but I don't know, sometimes she doesn't seem to get it. She doesn't seem to get it. But you know, the guy, you know, he gets it all the time. He gets it. Ironically, he doesn't get it, right? And she's getting it because she's asking the question. But in fact, so sometimes ask yourself this. Um, I'm not saying don't ask questions, but start to ask, do I even need to ask this question? We as women, oftentimes we will ask questions, not even on behalf of ourselves, but because we know that the question needs to be asked. So if you're going to do that, be very cognizant in how you're asking that question. You might say something like, you know, I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page here. Basically that's saying, I know what's going on, everyone else doesn't know what's going on. <laughs> Let's make sure that we're all on the same page here. So you know, start to make these types of statements before instead of just saying, what's going on here? So, so realize that. Um, again, I'm not saying that don't ask questions, but sometimes you may not need to ask as many questions as you do ask. The men, I've had men participate in this training session, and afterwards they've come up to me and they said, they go that whole thing about, um, about uh, asking questions, you're totally spot on. They said, um, we don't ask questions because we don't want to know what's going on, and then we don't know what's going on, and we end up getting together afterwards with all the guys, and we talk about what happened, really. And they said, and what ends up happening is, we're networking. Yeah. So, really quickly, I've got three minutes left here. So, in-person branding, when you introduce yourself, please, if you're introducing yourself to somebody who you do not know, 
introduce yourself, step firm handshake, first name and last name. Now, oftentimes I will hear from people that say, I've got a very confusing last name, it's very long. I personally have a very confusing last name, it's very long, Takayama. But you know what? People will remember you better. First name and last name. Engagement. Who's taking the meeting notes? How and where are you sitting? So when I talk about who's taking the meeting notes, my recommendation would be when you're in a meeting, don't be the one who's just head down taking meeting notes all the time. You're actually not engaged with the alpha in the room. So recognize that. If you totally have to take meeting notes, take them, jot something down. You do not want to have your brand be the note taker in the meeting because that will quickly become your brand. How and where are you sitting? Oftentimes we think that in meetings we sit totally perpendicular to the person, totally perpendicular to the table, equidistant to the person to the left, equidistant to the person to the right. That's not reality. This is reality. This is actually totally not reality. This is mad men. <laughs> but, but take a look at the way that these guys are sitting. They're sitting in a manner where they actually have their back to everybody. So even right now, so right now it's a little bit different, but everyone's not facing me. So some of you are facing me. I actually have noticed you a lot because you're totally fully facing me. Your chair is facing me, and so I've noticed you, right? And so think about that. This actually goes back to engagement. So to be fully engaged, don't worry that you might be blocking the person next to you because you want to be noticed by the individual. This is incredibly powerful stuff. There was a company that we worked with in LA where what they did was they realized that um, they would have their um, <coughs> Uh, recent USC UCLA grads come up and, and do a Q&A with the interns that went to UCLA and USC. And then afterwards, HR would go into them and say, so who do you want to kind of start to potentially extend offers to? And then they began to realize, wow, they're only extending offers to the people who are fully facing the front. They're only extending offers to men. So the HR organization was really progressive and they thought, well, we've got a stadium. So let's actually sit everybody in the stadium so everyone's facing. As soon as they did that, it was 50-50. So again, remember that, engagement. These are the little things from a humility perspective that you brought up that you can start to change in how you sit, how you approach, how you're viewed, how you're engaged with the organization. So virtual branding, just very quickly, LinkedIn, our recommendation is to make sure you've got one. Accurate dates, information, spelling. Start to put your professional branding statement on your LinkedIn. Have a good photo of yourself. If you don't have a good photo of yourself, it's actually branding yourself that way. Google yourself. So here's some action steps. So complete your professional branding statement, practice, update your LinkedIn profile. If you've got reviews within your organization, consider that as an opportunity to be able to take your new branding statement to your company. Volunteer for projects. If you want to, so Suchet, for example, you want to actually become a director of the hospitalist, volunteer. Volunteer for maybe something that a director might do. Start to get them to know you as a potential management candidate. Don't wait to be asked. Network, network, network. Again, I love the fact that you are here. Continue this network. Remember, networking does not mean that you have to get together five times over a glass of wine, have a sleepover, have one of you turn to each other and say, you're my best friend, and then feel comfortable with that individual. Link in with one another if you haven't done so already. The fact that you are meeting each other, you have now already built a connection. Remember that. And then finally, my recommendation would be consider scheduling an accountability meeting. You know, you're starting to build this network out. Get together again in six weeks' time. Schedule a lunch, schedule a dinner, schedule drinks, get back together again. And then say, hey, let's be accountable. Let's be accountable for this brand. So I'm gonna leave you with one last thought. So forever, we're always told in business, it's all about who you know, it's all about who you know. Our whole mantra is, it's not about who you know, it's about who knows you. Did your brains explode a little bit right now? <laughs> Fireworks went off? So remember that, it's not about who you know, it's about who knows you. And if they know you, know you, they should know you based on your terms, not based on the reputation and the brand that's been created by you unconsciously. So with that, this is who I am. Again, my name is Mako Takayama. My email address is mako at inawe.com. My brand is, is that I'm a connector, I'm a promoter of women, I'm a change agent, I'm a visionary CEO. Please connect with me on LinkedIn. Please follow us on Twitter, we are in, at, at We Are In Awe, or Mako Takayama, like the Advancing Women Executives page on Facebook. 
I am a connector, which means that I actually do respond to every single email that I get and every phone call I get. So please do not hesitate to contact me if you have any questions. And I'm so incredibly honored to have been here with you today, so thank you, sir, very much for the opportunity. <laughs>